Okay, so I think I shall begin my webinar. I do see some uh, familiar names. So uh, thank you for joining me uh, on a Thursday evening for today's webinar. And uh, of course, today um, I will focus more on the indices. So I think there's a lot of action that is uh, playing out in the US. Um, of course, uh, some of the key themes that we can watch out for as well in terms of Japan, um, China, and uh, I'll also touch a little bit on uh, Singapore. But of course, uh, given that you know a lot of you, or uh, we see that a lot of clients have actually been trading the US market, so I'll just focus on that a little bit more. And it comes at a time you know we are looking towards the earnings season. Um, so we have Netflix earnings just this week. Next week we have Tesla, and then following week we will have a whole series of uh, mega cap uh, tech earnings. And of course, given this a uh, positive relationship between the S and P five hundred earnings, between all of these uh, big tech earnings and the S and P five hundred, whether the rally can sustain, you know, ultimately lies in the near term on whether the earnings can actually deliver. Okay, so we know usually the mega cap has a strong history of uh, outperforming uh, market expectations, uh, but some of the focus will clearly be on the outlook, okay, on um, whether um, their upcoming uh, revenue, their top and bottom line forecast will actually exceed uh, market expectations. So that will also be the key as well. So without further ado, I'll just dive straight into today's uh, content. But before I do so, uh, just a disclaimer. Uh, do take note that today's uh, presentation is purely for you know educational and informational purposes only. I have to put it out that it doesn't constitute any form of investment advice. So for your own trading or investment, please do uh, your own due diligence. Okay, so today is really just about me sharing my views um, and it's just for uh, knowledge purposes. Okay, for those who doesn't know me, uh, of course, I see a lot of names. A lot of you, you know, have uh, tuned in for my previous webinar. Uh, but for those new, um, you know, new attendees, uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm the market strategist for IG Singapore. And uh, some of the um, socials channel that we have uh, Twitter. If you are into Twitter, you can follow me at eat underscore IG. I think a lot of you are into Telegram, so we actually have a Telegram group as well called uh, you can just search IG Asia. So almost every day, I think every day we will actually publish uh, analysts, um, you know, analysis articles from our various analysts worldwide. So you can just follow for, you know, a lot of uh, reactive, up to date kind of a content. Uh, if you are into Instagram, uh, you can follow our handle at igcom.sg. Okay, so I'll just leave it here for just a few seconds if you just want to, you know, just want to follow our social handles. Okay, moving on. I think let's get into the crux of the whole uh, market situation here. Um, if you just take a look at the indices performance year to date, uh, we have just round up the first quarter of the year, very, very strong performance that we have seen. Um, no surprise, you know, if you look at the chart on the left, the US indices year to date performance has been very strong, uh, mostly being heavy carried by the NASDAQ. So you can see the NASDAQ clearly pulling ahead with a gain of uh, 20, 20 plus percent that helped to lift the S&P 500. But if you just look across, uh, you know, last two weeks, if you were to look at the light blue line, you will realize that there are actually some form of a catch-up play, um, you know, being uh, materializing in the Dow Jones and the Russell 2000. Okay, so later I will just, you know, show you one of the chart um, of why this is happening. Of course, one of the key team has been around the Fed easing, right? We are looking towards a potential rate cut in September and potentially another one towards the end of the year potentially around November to December period. So clearly we are looking ahead towards the Fed's policy easing. Generally that is uh, supportive of uh, companies' uh, net costs. You know, it suggests that the, the rate environment is getting less restrictive. So that is, uh, you know, that has been fueling a lot of this uh, optimism around US equities. And lately, you know, it has been fueling a lot of optimism around the laggards 
So you can see uh, Dow Jones, Russell 2000 has clearly been pulling off. Um, whether there's room for them to grow further, I think the answer for me is yes. So later I'll just show you some of the technicals uh, that we are looking at. So if you look at the chart on the right, that is where the Asian indices are. And uh, likewise, no price for getting it right. The pull ahead is in the Nikkei, uh, and then followed by uh, most of the other regions. So you can see the STI um, kind of uh, year to date positive as well, along with uh, some others such as, you know, Cosby, uh, the uh, ASX. Um, Hang Seng year to date is still uh, positive, uh, but you can see that um, back in May, there was actually this strong surge such that it delivered around 15%. Uh, but lately, the momentum kind of dizzying off uh, a little, uh, given that the economic data just doesn't support a very strong fundamental backdrop for China's economy. So that is why you know it has really been uh, pairing back a lot of the gains, uh, currently hovering kind of flat around the single digit uh, gains. So for Asian indices, the pull ahead is clearly in the Nikkei. So later I'll just touch on that as well, whether there's room for it to go further. You know, the potential, um, my answer is potentially yes, considering that we could be looking at a fundamental shift in this uh, economy. So later I'll just touch on that. Um, in terms of the US sector performance, so I split it into, you know, the sort of, I name it, the old economy sector. So those are your like, you know, your financials, energy, industrial materials, uh, and I separate it to the new economy, which is your growth sector. So that is where the, you know, all of the AI hype has been revolving around. And clearly the new economy has been doing a lot of heavy lifting. If you look at the tech, if you look at the consumer uh, discretionary, it has delivered 20% gain year to date. Okay, whereas for the old economy, uh, still hovering around that 10% range. And that is why, you know, um, with that kind of a rotation playing out, you know, many of those laggards are starting to see some form of a pick up. So of course, near term, there's a lot of optimism that is fueling the laggards, given that the policy environment is getting less restrictive. But ultimately, whether they can match up to expectations with a turnaround in terms of their earnings, um, for that we will have to see. Okay, but at least for now, you know, let's just ride the wave where the markets are kind of uh, feeling uh, optimistic around all of this uh, easing process. Okay, for defensive, clearly lagging behind, uh, given the risk on environment, we are seeing consumer staplers, healthcare, utilities, not gaining a lot of a, a traction, I would say, but nevertheless, still, still pushing with a single digit gains year to date, uh, not too bad, but of course, a lot of the action is clearly on the tech for the first half of this year. So if you look at the VIX on the right, generally it is a risk on environment, uh, when we look at a VIX index, um, you know, anything between uh, 10 to the 20 level, uh, we tend to look at it as a risk on environment. When it crosses above 20, uh, that is where, you know, uh, it suggests that our markets are getting a little bit more fearful. But otherwise, you know, trading between this uh, 10 to 20 range, uh, generally it is uh, sort of a recent environment in place. So keep a lookout for that 20 level. You know, previously we did try to retest it, as you can see from the chart, didn't manage to punch through it. So now we are back towards uh, this zone. Of course, uh, near term, we are seeing some form of a consolidation in the US indices, and we are aging into this period of, you know, September, October, where Seasonality tends to show some form of a de-risking, some form of a pairing, some form of a profit taking, I would say. But whether it will um, you know, overturn the entire bull market, I think we've got to wait and see. The ultimate aim is to really just ride on the trend. But of course, as we head towards um, the September, October period, you know, some caution uh, may be warranted, especially after you know, that big type earnings release. Um, the question is really what next, right? We have that form of a sort of a gap before the end of the year where performance starts to pick up. But until then, you know, September, October tends to be a weaker period for the uh, US indices. 
So this is my key theme for the second half of 2024. Um, you know, if you just want to take a screenshot of that, please feel free to do so. Uh, generally for equities, these are my stands. So later I'll just touch on them a little bit more. Of course, uh, one is the Fed's focus may shift to growth from the current inflation. So no doubt inflation has been, uh, is still above target, but at least the general trend has been on the downside. And we have heard a little bit of a dovish rhetorics coming from uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell recently. So it seems that policymakers are starting to shift their attention more towards growth conditions. And there's a reason that they are doing so. Uh, later I'll show you that the chart that suggests that the recent run in economic data has been surprising on the downside, uh, which suggests a higher uh, kind of a growth risk compared to what markets were looking at. Okay, so clearly, you know, policymakers will start to shift their focus more on uh, growth conditions. And what does that mean? It does leave room for further rate cuts, um, which they are seeing a downside risk for the US dollar. And uh, if you're into bonds, I believe that now is the time to really lock in some of the uh, attractive views in terms of a uh, long dated bonds. Uh, in the short term, of course, if you look at the two year, you know, there still can be kind of an uncertainty um, given that, um, that, that the Fed is still very data dependent. So, so that could really drive a lot of volatility in the shorter dated bonds. But we are looking at the long dated ones. I believe that that could be attractive uh, if, you know, growth risk starts to show up in greater scales. Of course, uh, the laggards may potentially see a catch up. I believe that we are towards that later stage or that final phase of this uh, bull market. But how long it can run, um, at least I believe uh, that for now we are still in this economic normalization stage, okay, uh, where growth conditions are moderating. Uh, that really allows the Fed to have the room for policy easing. But ultimately, can they actually, you know, uh, deliver that soft landing that markets are pricing in at the moment? Uh, we got to keep a look up for the data over the coming months, uh, because we have to understand that policy easing tends to come with some lag. Okay, so even when the Fed, you know, can they can cut rates by 25 to 50 basis point, um, number one, the rates environment will still be in restrictive territory. Okay, and secondly, you know, any form of easing may take time for it to play out in the economic conditions. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you cut rates today, next day, you know, uh, the, 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 the economy is able to receive that form of support. Generally, it takes time, roughly six to nine months. So until then, you know, economic conditions will continue to face some form of a pressure and whether, you know, um, uh, we can ultimately see a soft landing you know, we got to look towards the upcoming uh, data. Next up, we have a Bank of Japan. Um, just today, if you were to look at the dollar yen, there has been a lot of a huge move, um, breakdown of a trend line. So that suggests that a potential trend reversal to the downside playing out for the dollar yen. So later, we'll just take a look at that chart itself. But for the Nikkei 225, uh, generally I'm sort of positive. I believe that we are looking at a income spending kind of economic cycle um, that could drive a paradigm shift. We could be looking at a more sustainable growth conditions for Japanese equities market moving forward. Next up, China. Um, China lately, you know, disappointment is coming back. Um, recovery is still at a standstill. Um, just this week, we have a, a few economic data that failed to impress, really. Uh, if you look at uh, retail sales, that has really been the focus. And, um, you know, domestic consumption is still very, very weak. So that has, it kind of grew all of this call for more policy support. But given that we have been looking at severe capital outflows, and the authorities have really been standing by their stance for currency stability. Uh, it does seem that any form of policy support will still be gradual. We are not looking at a stronger form of a punch. So that could potentially lead to disappointment 
forum market itself. So recovery still extends still, it is still a, I believe, a very much a longer term value play. Um, but for now, we really got to see more conviction for a turnaround in economic conditions. If you just look at housing prices, it actually continues to contract for the 14th straight month, even with all of those uh, housing support policy coming into play. So um, still challenging on that front, um, and recovery is still not um, providing a lot of conviction yet. So that's the third theme. The fourth theme is around Singapore. Closer to home, generally the STI has this reputation for being the region's safe haven. So what it means is that you know uh, the STI tends to be less volatile during times of uh, distress, uh, but of course, uh, any form of gains are also kind of limited. But nevertheless, I, I believe that the Singapore market actually provides this very good diversification in one's portfolio. Uh, you can see it as a more defensive play, and uh, recently it has actually break to its uh, you know few months high. But whether it can move further, you know, I believe the ultimate trading pattern for the STI is still within that uh, broad consolidation range that we have been seeing since the previous financial crisis back in 2008 and 2009. Okay, so later I'll just show you the chart on some of the levels that we can take a look out for. Last but not least, you know, uh, gold. Uh, generally, I'm still seeing some form of a bullish uh, catalyst that could help to fuel uh, more upside in gold prices. Uh, of course, if we talk about a weaker US dollar, lower treasury use, potential uh, safe haven flows with um, geopolitical tension in place, especially if you are talking about a Trump presidency, you know, we could see more and more geopolitical uh, tensions kicking in that may be supportive of the yellow matter. And last but not least, um, I believe that a lot of the retail investors hasn't had their feet in gold yet. If you look at the, the positioning for the gold ETF, it hasn't really picked up even with uh, gold prices hitting record high. So catch up retail flows could be another uh, bullish catalyst for the yellow metal. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the Fed. So this is the probability table. So it kind of shows you what markets are pricing. So if you were to recall, you know, the, the Fed was looking for one to two uh, rate cut by the end of this year. And uh, previously, markets was, were only pricing for one rate cut. But if you look at the trend over the past two months, economic data has clearly turned in weaker. And what that means is that markets are saying that there's a need for the Fed to ease more. So the market has been pricing for back-to-back -back cuts. So they are looking at uh, one cut in September, one cut in November, and potentially another one in uh, December. So overall, we could be looking at 75 basis point of rate cuts that markets are pricing by the end of this year. And if you look at the inflation picture, generally, I believe that inflation are trending down. If you just look at this chart between the actual figure and the forecast, you know, it has been uh, playing out kind of well, you know, we are not seeing that that form of a pricing pressure resurgence that could, you know, jam stop the Fed's uh, easing process. Generally, things are still relatively stable and has been uh, trending down, uh, even though the pace has been slow, but, you know, the general trend is still on the downside. So that kind of gives the Fed some confidence to move towards rate cuts. And we have heard from them recently, right? Fed Chair Jerome Powell kind of um, have turned a little bit more dovish in his words. So previously, he was still very much data dependent, but recently he acknowledged more progress in inflation and he acknowledged, you know, a lot of dovish tone even on the uh, labor market front. So he said that, you know, demand and supply is coming into better balance. So he suggests that the threshold uh, for him to keep rates high for longer is, you know, very high. We really got to see a huge outperformance in the pricing pressure to really overturn his views. Otherwise, you know, September does seems like a, a likely timeline. 
you know, for the Fed to uh, start easing. Okay, so um, I believe the Fed will start to shift its focus more towards growth. Uh, for now, you know, markets can still argue that we are looking at a normalization stage where, you know, economic growth is starting to, to come back to, towards more normal levels from the COVID-19 period. Um, we have manufacturing and services PMI both in contraction territory. And of course, that will warrant the Fed to step in quickly. Why? Because if the trend continues, if we have the manufacturing and services PMI in contraction for a few more months, generally it does lead to a recession based on the previous instances like the one in 2019, 2008 and uh, early 2000s. Generally, when we have both manufacturing and services PMI dipping into contraction for a few months in a row, a recession tends to happen. Um, now we do have services dipping in, manufacturing trying to recover, but it's still in contraction territory. So it really does call for the Fed to jump in um, quickly to prevent a hard landing from happening. But you know, I would say that we shouldn't um, be too complacent, um, even though we have the Fed's uh, kind of support. But you know whether they can really help to step in to avoid that hard landing. Um, generally, I believe that let's let's not get too uh, complacent. I believe that we are still in this final stage of the uh, bull market itself. So we may potentially be looking at a few more months of a performance, but moving into next year, you know things could turn a little bit more uh, concerning in my view. Okay, this is the US Economic Surprise Index. So it compares the actual data with uh, what markets were expecting. We have hit the lowest level since January 2023. What that means is that economic data are turning in far weaker than what markets are expecting. Okay, so it suggests that market expectations can be a little bit optimistic and our economic conditions are actually far weaker. Uh, than what many people think. So that dip in economic surprise index clearly um, is concerning. Uh, that is why you know we really got to see a recovery, uh, something like a turnaround over the coming months. If not, we will have the market starting to worry about recession. Okay, but for now, now let's look at the US dollar. I think generally when we talk about a, a far less restrictive rate environment, it means that you know, treasury yields will start to go down. That will track the US dollar. Um, I believe the stand is a bearish uh, US dollar. Uh, this is the um, technical side of things. I think uh, just today, if I'm not wrong, this chart is a little bit uh, outdated. I think just today, that trend line, that outward trend line is being put to the test. We could be looking at a breakdown. And if you have that breakdown, you know, that could leave the next level at around the 102.74 level on watch. But generally, I believe for the US dollar, it's a kind of a bearish stance. We could potentially sell the top uh, for the US dollar. But what should we buy, right? If you're talking about a bearish US dollar stance, I believe that we could be looking at some of the treasury bonds to really lock in some of the use. Um, uh, which are which are very attractive, and we are also able to to take advantage of any uh, outside appreciation in the event of a uh, greater economic risk. So one of it is the TLT. Um, I think very uh nice uh, bullish technicals here. Uh, if you look at the chart, you know previously it has been trading on that descending channel. There was a breakout. Uh, we move back to retest it and then it's found uh, some form of his support and things are going on the outside again. So TLT could be one um, that you can put on your watch list. Okay, um, but in terms of equities, you know, um, I believe probably if you are holding uh, any equities, yes, I mean, you can continue to hold, but if you are thinking of taking up new positions, um, then probably, I would, my, my suggestion is probably to wait for a sort of a retracement. I think things are getting a little bit, you know, we could see some form of a near-term weakness 
Okay, like I mentioned, um, going into that September, October period. And of course, some of the technicals I'm looking at also suggest that uh, upside momentum has been kind of weakening. Uh, later, I'll just show you the part on the technical side. Um, but on the fundamental side, you know, we are seeing the treasury yield curve kind of uh, uninverting. So previously, it has been, um, you know, in this deep inversion. Uh, now we are undergoing this uh, uninverting process. And whenever the treasury yield curve uninverts, you know, it tends to bring some form of a pressure um, for the equity markets, you know, some form of a near-term weakness. Um, but of course, the key that we should look out for is when it completely uninverts. Generally, a few months later, um, if you look at that gray bar there, you know, that is a period of recession. So, you know, the risk of recession, I believe, is there. Okay, but uh, that's why we probably got to uh, not be too complacent, you know. Um, hopefully, the Fed, I mean, a lot of hopes have been on the Fed to, to deliver that kind of soft landing. Uh, whether they can do it, I think nobody knows. Uh, even they themselves doesn't know. Um, but we got to turn a little bit more caution uh, if we were to see that Treasury yield curve uh, uninvert, which I believe it will. And uh, you know, a few months later, generally a recession tends to hit. So we got to track uh, a lot of those um, economic data very, very, very closely from now on. Okay, this is the roundup of where the various economies stand. Um, you can see that we are in this late stage of uh, economic cycle. And that is why I believe that we could see that final phase of uh, sort of the bull market playing out. Um, but into next year, you know, we probably got to pay a little bit more attention. So the last phase, I believe, will be that rotation towards the laggards, you know, the value sectors to really try to push uh, the broader S&P 500 up. And uh, Russell, of course, it carries a lot of risk. But if we were to look at previous, you know, how previous uh, rotations started out, um, generally when you have... Um, you know, when investors are thinking where to put their capital, of course, they'll put on to the, the sort of the big techs, uh, big, big tech companies where there is a growth proposition and they also have a consumer staplers kind of a defensive kind of proposition because when we have economic risk, you know, the big tech is very strong in terms of their balance sheet. They have a very firm ecosystem. Their business model is stable. So that big tech usually can be looked upon as, you know, sort of that defensive kind of a play. Um, I would say even safer than many of those consumer staplers or those are defensive industry that we are looking at. So that is, that you generally draw the bulk of the capital. Uh, but thereafter, with valuation, you know, carried so high, markets will start to look for more opportunities. That will be where the value sector is. If you know, when uh, earnings start to moderate, you know, capital will shift towards the value sectors. And thereafter, you know, the final stage will be towards many of those riskier assets, the small cap. So once the tech sector has run up, the value sector has run up, the small cap has run up, you know, that will suggest that there has been a full on complacency in the market. And that is where we got to sort of really be a little bit more careful. So for now, we are at that stage where the value sectors are still running, the small cap are still running. That could still help to fuel uh, the upside for the broader index. But the question will be, you know, once those have run, uh, once those have actually delivered their run, um, you know, that is where um, that full-on complacency could really lead to, um, you know, some of the danger in terms of the market. So that will be something that we'll be looking out towards um, that September, October kind of a period. For China, um, still recovering, but it has been in that early recovery for, you know, uh, since the start of this year. Um, still recovering, but it is a, a sort of a very gradual uh, kind of a pace. Um, you can also look at Eurozone and UK. Uh, things are starting to sort of turn around a little bit. So I believe that, you know, some of the assets in Eurozone and UK could potentially see, uh, be a beneficiary, you know, of some of the uh, rotation play. Okay, so on the technical side of things, let's take a look at the uh, goal. 
So recently we have a all time high. Uh, it does marks a break of a consolidation pattern. And that suggests that, you know, the broader upward trend persists. Uh, we may see it move uh, higher over the coming months. Uh, if you look at some of the catalysts, as I mentioned earlier, a weaker US dollar, a lower treasury use, some of the dovish bets in place, safe haven flows amid a geopolitical tension. And last but not least, of course, uh, what I'm looking at is that gold ETF holdings. So you can see that even with gold prices hitting all-time high, um, the, the gold holdings has actually been trending lower. So that suggests that, you know, potentially many of those retails hasn't been um, dipping into gold yet. So once they start to do so with that run up in price, it does add to some of the uh, buying power uh, for gold prices. So generally for gold, uh, I'm taking on a more uh, bullish stance. Okay, in terms of US equities, um, if you look at the uh, speculative positioning in the uh, futures market, um, generally those large speculators, hedge fund, they are starting to un unwind uh, many of their shorts, they are turning a net long. Uh, once they turn net long, you know, they could add to some form of a, of a upside for the uh, broader S&P 500. Uh, some levels that we are looking at is when, you know, this level starts to turn towards the, the more extreme uh, overbought, as you can see from the red, um, red dotted line over there. That generally tends to suggest a unwinding in the equity market. But for now, we are still at this stage where there is still that room um, potentially for major US indices to push, you know, a bit uh, further before we reach uh, those levels. So for Dow Jones, uh, I think this chart, I think it's outdated. I think the levels are, are, are higher than what you see here. Generally, we are looking at a breakout to you know a new record high. Um, given by this projection, it does suggest that for the 2,700 level, maybe one to watch for the Dow. For the S&P 500, generally we have that upward channel and levels to watch will of course be that 5,800 level. That is where the, the upper channel resistance stands. So still potentially, you know, some room to go. Uh, even with a retracement, we can keep a lookout for that lower channel trend line to, you know, sort of form a higher low and continue on with that uh, upside or momentum, at least uh, in the near term. Okay, so this is the uh, weekly. So of course, uh, if you were to see a push to the 5,800, uh, we may expect some form of a easing, um, something like the one back in uh, early 2024. Uh, rationale is that the, the weekly chart seems to present some form of a bearish uh, divergence where you know the S&P 500 is making higher highs, um, but the Momentum indicators uh, are not making higher highs. Uh, that is where we have this bearish divergence. So probably pushing a little bit more to 5,800, and then we may start to see some form of a, a near-term weakness kicking in, some form of an unwinding. For the NASDAQ, uh, likewise, uh, of course, uh, a bearish divergence playing out as well. Uh, recently, it has also been on that you know, uh, we can actually draw that, that near-term channel pattern. Um, so things are not, you know, based on the risk reward, at least at current point in time, um, the risk seems higher to me. So if you want to take a long position, uh, probably I will want to see some form of an unwinding, um, you know, uh, to potentially buy at a lower levels. Okay, on the weekly chart as well, uh, you can see the risk of a uh, near-term profit taking seems high. Um, bearish divergence on uh, MACD, RSI, if things was to start to turn, you know, it could unlock some of the fresh uh, selling pressure. We could be looking at near-term near uh, profit taking. But of course, in any form of retracement, um, our attention will be turned to that upward trend line in place. Uh, you know, whether, you know, buyers can step in to defend the outward trend line, uh, that will be what I'm watching. But if you were to ask to go long at current point in time, I believe, you know, to me, the risk 
um, seems uh, high uh, compared to the return. So I would take more of a cautious uh, stance at the current moment. Okay, so I think now we are looking at what is, um, you know, what this chart is saying. So I think the tech has a very strong run. Um, and generally when the, if we are changing from a period of a stronger growth earnings to one where, where growth, uh, earnings growth are starting to moderate or ease a little, that is where a uh, value may tend to outperform. Okay, so you can see from this chart that uh, that shows uh, very nicely that value tends to outperform when a turning point in the profit cycle is rich. Okay, so hopefully, you know, potentially we could be looking at it uh, playing out and, uh, you know, we could still see uh, more room, you know, for those uh, laggard value sectors to see some form of a catch up. Okay, of course now um, we are in mid-July, so um, generally things, you know, sort of uh, uh, kind of favorable, probably a little bit more, and then until August, uh, the seasonality tends to show some form of a weakness, uh, September as well, so, you know, we are heading into this sort of uh, seasonally uh, weaker period of the year around uh, August and September. So of course my stance is that, you know, uh, we can see markets push a little bit more, uh, but I won't really jump into it right now, um, given that the, the thing is, you know, after the big tech earnings, we have this, um, I would say this gap, um, this period where, you know, uh, markets will start to potentially profit take, you know, with the big tech earnings, and uh, a lot of the rate expectations has also been priced for the Fed to cut rate in September. Uh, markets are really pricing in that now. So when the Fed really deliver a rate cut in September, it does carry no surprise. We could actually see, uh, potentially see some form of a sell the news uh, playing out uh, in terms of September because markets have really priced uh, that in. So, you know, um, I may expect some form of a near term uh, kind of weakness. But of course, if you see any pullback, you know, watch out for the outward trend line to see whether it holds uh, because it does provide the opportunity, you know, to to sort of uh, have some uh, bottom picking in that sense. But at least for now, um, you know, just be a little bit more uh, cautious. Okay, in terms of the Bank of Japan, uh, for those looking at the Nikkei, of course, we have that push, very nice push to the multi-decade high. Um, I believe the Nikkei, you know, the upward trend may continue to persist. Um, like I mentioned, we could be looking at a paradigm shift um, where, you know, inflation are starting to stabilize above that 2%. And um, that has really been what the Bank of Japan uh, hope to see. We are also seeing stronger wage growth. So it really turned this uh, positive cycle where, you know, higher wages may translate to um, higher spending. And of course, higher spending translate to higher prices. Higher prices will be higher corporate profits. And that drives that whole cycle back towards the wages itself. So that could help to bring Japan out of its deflationary cycle. And uh, looking at the data over the coming uh, past few months, it does suggest that there could be, you know, some hopes of it playing out. And I'm generally uh, optimistic on that. Okay, for the PMI, the past month kind of a a, a bleak. Uh, but if we dive into the details, uh, I think some of the economic conditions are still showing some form of a strength, even with that headline um, being weak. So if you look at the the hiring trend, if you look at the company's uh, outlook, those have been very positive. And uh, if you look at you know um, some of the consumer spending, you know still weak, but generally we will hope that higher wages will help to drive you know some form of a tailwind for the aspect. So um, keep a lookout. I believe that we may start to see some form of a turn uh, in terms of these uh, PMI numbers. Okay, and uh, for Bank of Japan, uh, currently uh, most of it is expecting that uh, they may raise rates by September. 
um, you know, whether July or September, uh, January expectations are that further policy normalization should continue. Okay, and what does that mean is that for the dollar yen, um, you can see that generally it tracks the U differential very well. Uh, but if you were to plot that, you know, US, Japan, 10-year bond yield differential with that dollar yen chart, you will see that lately there has been that divergence where, you know, the dollar yen is trying to push a little bit more, um, but it's actually not being supported by that U differential a narrative that has been a leading the pair a movement over the past few years. So what I see of it is that, you know, um, if that um, U differential starts to narrow further, which I think it will, given that change in a policy between the Fed and the Bank of Japan, that could bring fresh weakness for the dollar yen. And I'll just bring you to this um, chart itself. Um, the upward trend line has uh, generally been uh, helping to support the uh, dollar yen since the start of this year. So you can draw this very nice upward trend line and uh, the pair has been bouncing off this trend line very nicely. Uh, you can count the number of times, potentially three to four times it has been supported. But uh, I think today uh, we are seeing some form of a fresh weakness kicking in. Um, we are looking at the daily RSI registering its lowest level since March. We are looking at a trend line uh, breakdown. So it does suggest that sellers are starting to take a little bit more control in that sense. So if you were to ask me, you know, my stance is kind of a bearish uh, dollar yen movement given that trend line breakdown that we see today. For the Nikkei, um, previously break above that channel pattern. Uh, now we are seeing some form of uh, a retracement. Uh, of course, for any retracement, what we are looking out for is whether it can deliver a new higher low. So some of the levels uh, that we could be watching, um, maybe around the 40,000 level. And then down below, we have that 38,260 level. But for now, it, the broader upward trend does seem to remain intact for the Nikkei 225. Okay, now let's turn our attention to China. Okay, um, before I do so, I just want to show you this uh, manufacturing uh, PMI heat map. So it does show that, um, you know, how things are holding up uh, in various uh, economies. Um, because if you want to put your capital, generally you want to, you know, lean towards those uh, economic, um, those economies where conditions are holding up you know, sort of stronger. If you were to look at this uh, manufacturing uh, PMI heat map, you know, certain um, region tends to stand out. Um, we have, um, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, you know, it is a export economy. And if you look at the manufacturing PMI heat map, very strong expansion right there, 54.7 as of June, um, very strong numbers. Uh, if you look at India, you know, continue to power on with that strong manufacturing activities playing out. And that is why the, the Nifty has also been hitting a multiple uh, all-time high. If you were to look at this uh, manufacturing uh, PMI, it does suggest a very strong expansion in its uh, economy. Other than that, uh, Taiwan, uh, but of course Taiwan we know that is kind of heavily leaning towards uh, many of the semiconductors. If you remove the semiconductors, actually the picture is far weaker for the other side of, uh, for the rest of the uh, goods itself. But nevertheless, you know that semiconducting, uh, semiconductor play has helped to lift uh, Taiwan trade activities. So it does seem to, you know, still appear uh, strong. Um, UK, you can see that the UK is uh, starting to recover. Uh, from its 2023 contraction. So, uh, you know, May, June, it has reverted to sort of um, expansionary territory. So things are starting to turn uh, around a little bit in the UK. But if you look, you know, France, 
uh, Germany, Europe, I think we got to see more clues. Uh, we got to probably wait and see a little bit more because our activities are still uh, kind of weak uh, over on that end. But at least uh, in terms of our region, uh, you can see the ASEAN region, you know, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, things are generally holding up uh, kind of well. Of course, uh, Vietnam, India has been that pull ahead. Uh, but generally, the region has been sort of, you know, really being well supported uh, in terms of the trade activities. Okay, but of course, uh, much will, a lot of eyes are on China. Um, and if you look at the recent run of economic data from China, back to that, you know, very lackluster uh, kind of a growth picture, uh, if you look at the chart on the right, you know, economic conditions continue to surprise on the downside. So we have that economic surprise index really dipping into negative territory. So what that means is that uh, market expectations are still being too optimistic on uh, China's uh, economic conditions. So uh, we really got to see, in a way, um, more forceful and more effective uh, policy support coming from China. Uh, at least on the fiscal side, they does has the room uh, to to sort of enact uh, greater spending to sort of try to boost uh, the consuming uh, the consumers um, uh, spending side of, side of you know the picture itself. Um, but whether they want to do so, um, that still remains a question. I believe that they may potentially still uh, put it on hold, um, given that you know, uh, they wouldn't really want to overstimulate uh, the economy being kind of restricted uh, with that capital outflows itself. So um, things are still hoping for a turnaround. Uh, we are still looking at that very bumpy kind of a recovery path. And if you look at the uh, pricing uh, prices, the PMI, you know, is still kind of a, a weak um, so that consumer picture is not uh, uh, it's not recovering as well as what many expect. So we may expect the uh, low for longer kind of a picture to continue for China. Uh, but of course, uh, we are seeing the authorities really putting on a, a floor for the uh, equity market. Um, so my view is that we may see it consolidate around the, the, the current move. So later I'll just show you some of the levels. I think it's more of a consolidation move that we are talking about as compared to, you know, a, a continued form of a downturn. Actually, because we are seeing that uh, China authorities are really trying to step in uh, to help to support uh, the, the equity market itself. So I think that helped to set some form of a flaw, but whether we can see a stronger recovery, ultimately we've got to take the cue from economic conditions. And given the current trend, it doesn't really provide much conviction. So uh, therefore, we may expect some uh, near-term consolidation playing out. Uh, in terms of housing prices, you know, no turnaround at the moment. Uh, housing prices are still contracting. So that property sector is still, have, is still weighing and potentially having a negative impact on uh, consumer spending, um, given that negative you know, wealth effect from uh, housing prices itself. So for Chinese consumers, a lot of wealth is locked up in houses, in, 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 their, in their property. And maybe they have prices, you know, really uh, contracting. Uh, it doesn't really offer a lot of conviction for them to boost or to increase, you know, their uh, spending ahead. Okay, look at the Hang Seng Index. So things has uh, unwind uh, from the April uh, search itself. Um, some key levels I'm watching out for, uh, that upward trend line that you can see around that 17,200 level. Okay, uh, that is what I'm watching, um, but I would expect that, you know, it could potentially um, um, trade in this arranging move between uh, 17,000 to 20,000. So for us to really see a break above that 20,000 mark, uh, we really got to see more positive surprise um, coming from economic conditions and coming from the corporate side of things. And why that 20,000 level? Um, if I just bring attention to the weekly chart on the right, 
um, you can see that cloud resistance has actually been weighing on you know the that Hang Seng uh, index on at least uh, three times. Okay, so for us to really have that greater signal of buyers taking longer term control, uh, we got to see a move above that twenty thousand uh, psychological level. Okay, until we see that, you know, I think things could continue to trade along. Um, you know, this broad consolidation around 17,000 to 20,000. Okay, last but not least, uh, let's take a look at the Singapore market. Um, lately, there has been some form of a traction coming back in. Um, I believe that that uh, catch up, that laggard kind of a catch up trade has been benefiting the STI as well. We are seeing some form of a traction in the banks, the three local banks. If you look at the REITs, it uh, the REIT sector, um, past week there has been very, very strong volume coming into play, a much higher than average form of a volume. And then we have seen that huge surge. Uh, so I think that laggard um, catch up play has been benefiting the, the Singapore REITs as well. So um, generally, I believe there could still be more room to run uh, for the uh, STI. Uh, in terms of institutional fund flows, you can see from this chart, um, previously there has been a strong outflows, you know, because institutions just prefer, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> institutions just prefer to have their capital in uh, markets such as, you know, Japan, uh, India, US, where things are, are clearly uh, delivering on that front. But for the STI, at least for now, we are seeing that outflows from institutional kind of a, a ease a little bit, uh, and we are seeing some uh, traction uh, coming back. If you look at the chart in the middle, we are looking at two straight weeks of uh, institutional net inflows into the STI. So that kind of uh, bought well uh, for the STI, and some of the, the levels uh, that I'm looking at, if you were to look at the chart on the right, that is the weekly STI chart. Okay, so I believe that we may potentially see some form of a retest of that 3,650 level. So that was actually where the index, uh, you know, formed a high back in 2018. Uh, and around, you know, 2008, uh, there was some form of a resistance uh, there as well. So I think the STI may have room to retest back that uh, 3650 level. But whether we can actually enact a upward breakout, uh, my view is that probably not yet. Uh, my rationale is that uh, the STI is still very much value focused. Uh, we are really having a very high weightage on the banking sector that three local banks, you know, that three local banks actually takes up around 50% of the index weightage now. So previous month, they were still taking up 45%, 46%, but with their recent surge in share price, they actually account for close to half of the uh, STI the weightage. So for us to really have that form of a outward breakout uh, above that 3,650 level, um, I think we got to see uh, more and more traction coming for the banks, um, which I am, you know, I mean, earnings are strong, um, but in terms of the growth prospects, I think we still got to see a little bit more coming from the bank. So we know their net interest income has generally peaked, uh, given the interest rate environment. They are really depending on that non-interest uh, non income portion to try to you know support things a little bit. Um, but I believe that earnings resilience story may only have you know that much to run. Um, so it really got to take much more, you know, for, for the STI to really break above this multi-year uh, kind of a consolidation uh, pattern. So I think we may, you know, that 3,650 may be one to watch, you know, once we are hit there, you know, we could potentially partial uh, profit take. Because for us to really see more, you know, I think we got to see more conviction uh, coming from the broader uh, global economic condition side of things. Okay, but at least for now, the you know institutionals have sort of eased their outflows. 
uh, retail, retail has always been buying into the STI. So retail investors have been really supporting the local markets. Um, but now, you know, they are starting to unwind a little bit. Uh, some changing of hands with uh, the institutions. So I think, you know, generally when we see the institutional, uh, the institutions kind of coming back in, you know, that may help to support the uh, STI a little bit. Okay, so with that, you know, uh, I've come to the end of uh, today's presentation. So today's presentation is really more on the, um, you know, some of the equity markets in US, uh, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore. I didn't really touch too much on some of the commodities and some of the uh, FX trade. Uh, rationale is because I think previous webinar I have touched, uh, you know, a, a good part on FX. So today, you know, I just want to focus a little bit more on the equity markets. So the next webinar, you know, uh, I may, you know, continue to focus on the uh, FX commodity kind of a space. Uh, of course, if you have anything that you want to see or you want to, to learn more about, you know, um, do feel free to scan this QR code. It is the feedback form or you can just tell me what you are looking streamline that into a uh, uh, feedback form probably I'll just take a look at uh, some of the questions uh, that you have uh, let me see okay first question uh, are you expecting a correction in October November horizon in the Nasdaq S&P 500 um yeah so just now, I you know, for now, I'm I believe the risk of going long at current point in time can be dangerous in my view, due to some of the uh, bearish divergence on the weekly chart. So I think we may see some, you know, near term profit taking, and especially as we head into the September, October period, um, the seasonality effect doesn't uh is not in our favor, right? And if you talk about the November US election, if you just look at past, um, you know, past election, generally the lead up to US election tends to carry a lot of uncertainty. So market participants may not want to take on too much risk heading into the US election. But the thing is, once that election picture clears, uh, generally the US equity markets can regain their footing and potentially find some room for upside. So I think for now, the, we are heading into some uh, indecision, uh, at least in the uh, third quarter, uh, potentially into the US elections. But once that clears, you know, I think that, that uh, things should be much uh, brighter, you know, for the US equity market. So that is my view. Um, next one, in September, we see a cut by the Fed. What do you expect again? The US dollar up, indexes down. Um. Yes, I think markets have fully priced in a rate cut in September. Um, so if we were to see that happening, I wouldn't expect too much of a surprise, you know, there. A lot of it really hangs on um, the outlook moving forward. Um, if you were to see back-to-back -back cuts, you know, if the Fed were to guide for, you know, back-to-back um, um, -back cuts in October, November, I would actually argue that uh, that may prompt uh, U.S. indices to go down, uh, the U.S. dollar to go down as well. Uh, rationale is that, um, yes, I mean, the Fed is heading into that policy easing process, but for them to deliver that back-to-back -back cuts, you know, it may prompt fresh concerns on economic conditions. Okay, so what markets are looking out for may potentially be that more patient stance in terms of easing. Uh, previously, they are looking at two rate cuts by the end of this year. Um, so if they were to stick through that, um, generally, I believe markets may like that. But if we were, they were to sort of guide for, you know, back-to-back -back cuts, uh, that really says something about the, the economic conditions. And I think, you know, that may drive some form of a unwinding in the uh, US indices. Of course, for US dollar, um, I think on a Fed easing process kind of a thing, the trend doesn't seem to be uh, in the US dollar favor. Uh, I believe that that could 
carry some form of a downward pressure, we could see a bearish trend for the US dollar moving forward. Okay, uh, next question. The, let's see. Historically, September and October are bearish months for US market and possibly correction. Uh, with the US election in November, what is the possibility of this not happening? Yeah, I think I answered this question previously. So um, the trend, if you look at past US presidential election, is that uh, the lead up towards the election tends to carry some form of a, a market indecision. Uh, we could be looking at some volatility in place, um, some uh, profit taking, some de-risking. But once that clears, um, you know, generally uh, markets like that. And um, past instances, uh, markets tends to rally towards the year end after that, you know, the US presidential election clears. So going by that trend, uh, you know, it suggests uh, um, potentially we may have a new term correction, but over that, uh, once we get over that hurdle, uh, things should improve. Okay, uh, are you organizing live market review? Um, live market review. I'm, I'm not too sure, you know, what you mean by that. Probably you can just, you know, fill out that feedback form and let me know uh, what you are referring to uh, when you talk about live uh, market review. Okay, uh, silver. Yes, uh, silver, I think uh, silver tends to trade in tandem with gold. Of course, it doesn't carry that huge of a weaker US dollar. When we talk about lower treasury yields, that tends to be supportive of uh, silver prices as well. Um, and if you look at the silver chart, it kind of points towards a bullish technicals. Um, it does suggest, you know, some form of a bullish flag breakdown as well. So I actually wrote about this, uh, I actually wrote about this um, two weeks back on silver prices. Uh, we are actually looking at a bullish flag breakdown. So generally, yes, I think um, silver prices seems to carry a bullish bias. Okay, next, um, are you proposing this kind of webinar on a weekly basis? Yes, so previously we do have a weekly uh, market scope, which is a, a very short, you know, half an hour weekly kind of a webinar to keep you updated, uh, to keep you updated on some of the market updates. Uh, we are looking to bring it back, uh, but of course we are still iron, ironing out some of the issues. Yeah, but once we, we are able to, you know, affirm that, uh, then we will definitely, you know, keep you updated on that. Okay, next, uh, August is always negative month for STI in past 10 years. Should we expect Singapore banks and REITs to drop or REITs should rise higher due to rate cut in September expectations? Okay, very good question. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to debunk this a little bit. Um, yes, it is true that August is always a negative month for STI in past 10 years. But, you know, uh, previously I went to um, investigate it further on why August, you know, past 10 years, past 10 years has been in the red. Um, the rationale is actually because, it can be kind of misleading. Uh, the rationale is because uh, many of the um, hard heaters, you know, the local banks, uh, the REITs, uh, they tend to pay dividends around August. And when, whenever we have that paying of dividend, you know, that prices will start to adjust. It's not a bad thing, you know, when, whenever you pay dividend, prices will, will drop, will adjust based on that dividend. So that creates a sort of, I would say that false impression that, you know, um, uh, things are always bearish for the STI in August, just by looking at that index uh, movement itself. Yeah, so I uh, just really got to debunk that a little bit, uh, that even though, you know, uh, if you just purely look at the STI price performance over the past 10 years, past 10 years, August has been negative, but we really got to factor in that dividend payout. Yeah, it's because that um, those uh, those uh, heavy constituents like the local banks, they really pay out dividends in August. Uh, Singtel also uh, as well. So that really kind of aligned where, you know, August uh, carried that form of a... a, a, a 
so say that bearish action for prices, uh, but it really doesn't mean that you know uh, things are bearish. We got to factor in the dividend as well. If you factor in the dividend, you know things are generally uh, more 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 brightening. I would say in terms of uh, August performance. So just uh, uh, keep a, a, a look out on that. Yeah. Okay, is the drop in Singapore non-domestic oil export? Yes, very good question. Uh, I can see that you are very up to date. Uh, with the, the Singapore export numbers, you know, just out uh, very recently um, and that underperformance uh, right there. So, of course, um, I would say usually for Singapore's uh, non-domestic oil export, things can be a little bit bumpy. So, previously we have that uh, very strong uh, underperformance, um, but, you know, we really got to look on a trend basis. Yeah, so um, previously we also have, you know, some of the scare, you know, previous month, there was a month where there was a deep contraction, but the next month it recovered very, very strongly. Um, so we got to average it out on a, a tr sort of a three-month basis. So of course, with today's uh, drop, uh, it does, you know, keep us a little bit more cautious, but uh, we really got to look towards upcoming uh, kind of a, a data to really form a trend because uh, that Singapore non-oil domestic export has that tendency to, you know, create a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I would say a lot of noise where there isn't much of a clear trend if you just look at it on a one month kind of a data. So yes, uh, do keep a look out on the trend uh, moving forward. Yes, so um, next question, how do you find those macro charts such as inflow outflow statistics? It looks like the COT report. Yes, so um, if you are referring to the STI, uh, you can actually get the institutional and retail fund flow data on uh, SG investors. Okay, uh, they kind of aggregate it from the SGX website. So every Monday around 3 p.m., uh, the SGX will publish uh, the previous week uh, fund flow, uh, but if you they will just publish that hard number lah. But if you want that that trend line that that graph being plotted out for you, uh, I look towards SG investors. Uh, you can Google them. They actually provide that kind of a, a easier to understand chart lah. And uh, if you're talking about the the COT report, uh, I do get it from Reuters. Yeah, so um, yeah, that is a data provider. Uh, probably you got to subscribe to that. Um, yeah, but otherwise, you know, if you have that uh, weekly webinar running, so generally I tends to um, you know, provide fresh updates uh on that as well. So do uh keep a lookout for any news on that. Yes. Okay, so let's see is there any other questions. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I have overrun a little bit by 10 minutes. Uh, but anyway, you know, thank you very much for tuning in for today's uh, webinar. Do let me know what you want to, uh, you know, learn more about, uh, whether you are into, you know, forex, commodity. Do let me know in that uh, feedback form. And uh, otherwise, you know, I will see you in the next webinar. And thank you and have a nice evening.